Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabot's Experience. Bye. It was helpful if I use a microphone. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabot's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabot. Our guest today is James Scherer. James, are you ready to be great today? Yes, I am ready to be great today. A driven and a little leader, James has over 20 years of experience continually developing strong ongoing relationships with the correct people for, for proven sales and marketing to implementation in businesses impacted by rapid growth, change of crisis. An entrepreneur since 17, he worked across teams to establish a 7,000 lead sales strategy, attained a 197 yearly increase in client onboarding, guided a sales force to achieve a 33% yearly increase in sales and increase multiple marketing campaign penetration by 30%. So that's a lot of good stuff there, James. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, and, and thanks for being here again, like I said. So Thank James, what, what, what does it mean even analytical? I think a lot of people use the term, I'm, I'm analytical, but I don't think they really know yeah. what it even means, right? What does it mean to you to be analytical? Um, to analytical to me is um, very process driven. Uh, very oriented towards a scientific nature as opposed to a um, very artistic driven process. And so for me, I think about um, working in sales management and sales processes. Uh, it's, you know, having a set pattern of um, this are the different steps in the sales management process from auditing the practices to um you know, everything from improving salesperson performance at the very end. And so for me to be analytical, I feel like it's more of a, a process, being a process oriented person. So. So it seems like most people are either creative or analytical. You very rarely first one like both of them, right? What's been your experience with that? Um, so I was actually just uh, finished up a book um, by 99U um, Institute. And it talks about the creative as an entrepreneur versus the non-creative person as an entrepreneur. And I really thought about it hard because I finished that book and then went to the, the previous version of their book, which was about managing your career and taking risks and, and being a, a true entrepreneur of your, of your career. And I really asked myself, like, if I was a creative person and how I fit into that, um, that background you know like do i am i actually a creative person um but being you know working with keller schrader now and working on you know being an entrepreneur of my career as an employee owner um i definitely feel like that's kind of more my my speed as opposed to being a creative person entrepreneur at this point so yeah i, I know one only know one person mary rosie uh she's like a good creative and good analytical mm -hmm. uh, and she's just like I mean, she's just a superstar, right? Everything she does in terms of gold, right? You just tell that she gets both worlds. It's very rare to see, to see I think. Mm -hmm. So how did, we, how did you become so analytical? Is this something, like this, this something you learn through muscle memory or, or practice? And, and can someone like just turn up one day and say, I'm an, an analytical or something you got to learn? Mm -hmm. I think part of it is um, I'm such a structured individual in my temperament. Uh, I'm such a kind of like we said, goals. I have to-do lists. I have tasks to do every day. I have reminders to do every day. Um, I feel like I was just kind of ingrained into me as a younger age. And so I've just became a more analytical person and setting up, you know, goals and tasks and reminders and responsibilities. So. Yeah. I hear you saying that stuff in my mind. Just like, yes, yes, yes. I'm the same way, right? <laughs> Checklists and to-dos and, you know, you know, Asana and program boards and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I'm sure yeah. some some creatives are like going bash it crazy. No, stop, stop, stop. I can't do that, right? It yeah. just amazes how different minds think. Yeah. So it's um, but like I said, I mean, I I, I literally just had that uh, thought in my head a couple weeks ago when I finished that book. Um, whether or not I was truly a creative trying to be an entrepreneur or if I just have a creative streak in me occasionally and I'm really more of a process driven entrepreneur entrepreneurial kind of person. So so, James, you have a code in your bio. Um, so, my basic question is, to you, why is it important to build relationships with the quote-unquote correct people? I think so many people get that wrong, right? They build relationships with people that are going to waste their time, are not going to build them up, make them build up people. How do you go about making sure you, you connect with the correct people, which is very important? Um, I feel like it's almost kind of like a, our sales approach at work. Um, you, you still take a shotgun approach to, like, reaching out to people, to network, 
and to um, build relationships to try to find um, common ground and synergies. Um, I think about it from a personal standpoint as the correct people will present themselves with their morals and their ethics and their behaviors. Uh, from a professional standpoint with us at work at Keller Schrader, it's more of um, our culture of ownership and our culture of um, you know, shared accountability, shared responsibility, and really looking at it as um, we are attracting the correct people to our environment. So then when we reach out to, you know, the, the, the client as a trusted advisor, we're looking for the correct clients, um, not so much a, you know, revenue goal or um, a capital, you know, capital gains goal, but actually like what the, the, the actual client we're looking for is very, you know, once a trusted advisor in the IT realm. So and, and, for, and how do you do this? Like, you know, if you met someone through a networking event or, or, or a mutual connection, mm -hmm. how long does it take you to figure out, hey, um, I want to see this to be not worth my time, but how long is it firm to take you to determine, okay, I can add value, they can add value to me versus, okay, this is just a waste of time for both of us. And how, what's your process for that? Um, I feel like it's uh, a process of, you know, tracking people through CRMs, whether it's HubSpot or we use ConnectWise at work. Um, to track our technical project management plus our um, account management. And so I feel like it's a, a process, but I also feel like when you get into the, the situation with the person one-on-one, -on -one, there is a, a feeling out process and you can really, you know, just from like interacting with people, emailing them, talking to them on the phone, having a face-to-face -face with them, a networking meeting over coffee or lunch, you're going to get the vibe and you're going to figure out if that person can bring you value or not, or if you can bring them value. And from the years of networking, I definitely know that, um, that it's a situation where you have to give more than you give, uh, I'm sorry, give more than you get, um, to be able to be successful. So, so James, here's another question for you. People always say, no, give value, you know, give like 51%, take 49%, always give, give, give. But there's a point where like you, you've given, 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 like example, like you suppose you did some 10 times with someone, right? Nothing big, mm -hmm. but like minor stuff, you know, make connections, help them out. And then you ask them to do something small for you and they say, no, like, it, do you cut them off? Do you keep on giving? Is there a cutoff point for that? Um, I feel like it depends on how you've read the situation. Um, you know, I do volunteer with several groups in, in the Nashville area. Uh, one of the groups I volunteer with, um, I do a lot of college relations. So my point for the college relations is to help with career management, like resume review, uh, job interview tips. Uh, and then from there, if I you know, do well in helping these people with a job interview preparation, and I see that they have a potential, I will, you know, maybe be able to refer them to a recruiter or maybe be able to refer them to a job that I know about in the Nashville area. Um, so I feel like it's a situation where I'm giving a lot. And even if they don't maybe respond to a recruiter in a timely manner, it's a situation where I have to understand that not everybody is as comfortable with networking and uh, putting in you know, putting people in touch with other people, doing things for other people. Like some people are very timid or hesitant to um, to reciprocate sometimes. So, James, can you talk about some of the challenges that, that people are having finding jobs nowadays? I don't, you know, on, it's all over LinkedIn. You know, you know, job description, um, entry level. You need ten years experience, and you know, blase, blase, right? Can you talk about yeah. some of that? Um, I feel like uh, it's an interesting situation uh, with Keller Schrader because being an employee owned company, we not only are working on behalf of our clients to fill HR needs, um, either remote or in person through the Midwest and Southeast, or we're looking for our own employee owners to help um, facilitate our you know, pillars of, of work, our business growth. And so I think what it comes down to is a couple of things. People have a um, maybe a misunderstanding of what kind of jobs are actually out there that are not being um, not being filled. You know, a lot of it may be hospitality, maybe retail, um, finding a you know an eighty thousand dollar job um, in a certain realm just may not be possible. I think the other thing is 
people are still trying to adapt to this uh, either remote work, hybrid work, um, or back in the office completely. And so I feel like, you know, what we've learned through the pandemic, not only with like supply chain constraints, but the office environment has made it to a situation where people are, are unsure of what to expect with their job description. So the job description could say, like you just said, Jason, you know, 10 years experience for an entry level job, uh, which is, you know, clearly not, not the point. Uh, but, you know, it also has to be a situation where there's synergy between the, you know, pay, what's required and what you're actually responsible to do. So, yeah. And I, yeah, I think there's a lot of blame everywhere. Like I retired from the army in 2015, you know, I have my own tech startup, I do a podcast every six months I go out and I, and I, and I look for jobs, right. Just to put myself out there, you know, and, you know, see what's out there. And 2015, there's a, there's a, a company here in Seattle uh, for HR manager. And that and the job is still out there, right? Seven years later, yeah. they're still applying for the same job. And every six months, that job's out there, right? It's like, there's no way, right? Yeah. And there has to be something that's uh, either the environment, uh, the culture. Um, you know, I'm, I'm feel very, I feel very blessed to be in the situation I'm in because I was able to, you know, transition industry and function um, in the last year. And it's been a breath of fresh air personally and professionally to be where I am. And, um, you know, we, we all, a lot of us at, at that, you know, at Keller Schrader have, um, you know, opportunities that, that come up and, and we stay because it's a great employee owned environment. And, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of turnover. So to your point about, you know, having the HR manager position role every six months, like we don't have that issue. Um, the average tenure for us is like 17 years for our employees. Um, so to say, uh, to say that we have, you know, issues with that would be misleading. So so for the HR position you hire for, are these like for like certain size companies, certain industries? Yeah. So most of them are IT related uh, positions that we're hiring for. Um, so when we have our HR team uh, looks into, um, you know, hiring for a client, the client will come to us with a requisition. Uh, we need a net developer. We need a uh, situation where we have a project manager, a program manager needed. And so what we'll do is um, we'll seek out requisitions for those positions and then post them um, through our company. Um, the company possibly has posted it themselves as well. Uh, it's just, a, you know, it's just kind of like being a recruiter and, and a staffing arm as our, for our company. So, so James, what do you see as far as the future work as far as like COVID and the brought on remote work? You said like some big corporation comes like trying to make people come back to the work to the workspace, you know, what do you see the future yeah. of that being? Um, I think what it comes down to is there are some companies that probably have that mentality that you have to be back in the office full time. Um, I feel like there's also some companies that will have a open minded approach to, you know, some people had their best years ever during the, the pandemic, uh, working from home, working remotely, working hybridly, if, if possible. And so I think it speaks to the fact that people are just as hard of a worker um, at home as in the office, but it gives you that freedom to, you know, do other tasks to, you know, be home with your kids if necessary uh, and still work. Um, and so for me, uh, I feel like it is the ability to kind of, like I talked about earlier, you know, be an entrepreneur of my career. Like I can structure my day to do different things at different times. I can test out different patterns. Like when I prospect, when I network, if it's a, you know, a morning, it's an afternoon, it's around lunchtime and, and test out theories about when's the best time to get a hold of people. Uh, it allows me to, um, you know, set the times for cadence with, you know, the different account people I have to follow up with, uh, work with vendors, do training. So I think that, it allows you, like I said, to be an entrepreneur of your career and allow you to be successful, you know, working from home, working hybrid. And I would hope that, you know, customers and clients and, you know, companies would see that. So. Yeah. I wish I could remember where I saw this at, but I remember reading somewhere where the stats show that people that work from home actually work more hours or longer than people in the office. Right. Cause you know, in your office, mm -hmm. you, first you had to spend what one hour, two hours driving back and forth to work. If you're in the office, yeah. you probably be on Facebook, you know, Bob, Bob, Thomas, Susan, walking by, you know, sit chat, you know, where you're at home. It's just a different way you can focus more on work. 
with of course yeah. you have to, of course you have some distractions right the kids and stuff another time i think we should forget like everyone wants to remote work but this remote work is like remote plus right you gotta like take care of kids be a teacher you know blase blase right mm -hmm. yeah yeah and so um i feel like you know it's a situation where like i said you're in charge of your own career and you're crafting it um as the entrepreneur of your own career you're not you don't have to be an entrepreneur of a business i mean you can take risks and, and build excellence in a career every day so so here's a question for you so i'm a big believer that everyone's not good at remote work like for me example right i can't work at home right because i'm like taking two or three naps binge watching mm -hmm. some show on tv right so how do y'all make sure when you're bringing people on that that person is actually set up for remote work is it is there, is there a program in your company where you make sure they're set for success or is it a test you give them or how does that work for y'all um, for us, uh, the way it worked is it's discussed in, in you know, the start of the interview process. Um, the interview process for us um, has, you know, I've known it to be short. I've known it to be long. Um, we have to understand that there are work cycles that have to be taken care of, whether it's building a bill of materials, doing a statement of work, um, the engineers, um, are in charge of making sure that they are getting their information from us. Um, we're getting information from them, uh, making sure that they uh, complete the tasks uh, for the inside product managers, you know, making sure the director of uh, infrastructure operations knows what's going on. Um, so for us, it's, you know, starting at the very beginning with that culture and that environment, understanding that we trust you to be remote. We trust you to be hybrid. Um, we understand that we, we, we won't micromanage you like that's not part of our environment or our culture um and it's just kind of going along and attracting people that we know are going to be successful in that that mode of of work so so james you've been an entrepreneur since you've been 17. can yep. you talk about you know how you decided to become an entrepreneur and your entrepreneur journey from 17 to now um i feel like i've always had um you know uh bone in my body that wanted to be a business owner um you know right now i'm i'm more in the career mode with you know it um so my entrepreneurship is more um hands off at this point i mean i still do have uh, a couple of entities that i work with um but i think it was just looking at what i wanted to do as a passion back when i was 17 uh and working in the music industry and um kind of crafting a business around that and so it kind of started that way and then over time it's morphed into more project management oriented you know for sales focus project oriented for event focused and you know being an entrepreneur is just something that i enjoy as part of my career and it's uh it's it's a it's a valuable piece of the puzzle because you have some skin in the game um just like i you know with keller schrader being an employee owner now um you have skin in the game and you want to make sure that you are, um, you know, taking care of what needs to be taken care of as a business owner, but you also have the opportunity to, um, you know, be, be a career owner as well. So James, what advice do you have for people like, you know, maybe one person, an entrepreneur, but you know, they're, they're coming like really making it and they're considering going back to you know, corporate America, so to speak and vice versa. Someone in corporate America is like entrepreneurial bug and they want to make the, make the plans to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, I feel like the advice I would give is the one thing I've, the one thing I've struggled with is trying to bridge the two, um, trying to be an entrepreneur and trying to work in corporate America because you obviously need, you know, some sort of capital if you're going to try to bootstrap the situation to start with, uh, if you don't want to go out and find funding. Um, the biggest thing with, um, you know, Keller Schrader is I'm allowed to, you know, work and have, you know, tasks to complete for them during the day. But then if I want to at night, you know, work on, you know, a hobby or a side project, it's, it's okay. And so I feel like trying to balance out the being an entrepreneur and working in corporate America, um, you know, can be difficult. And so my advice to people would be, you know, sit down and have a game plan for what you want to do and how you want to do it and see if it's possible. Um, communicate it to your family members, communicate it to your mentors, your trusted advisors and see what they say. So, yeah, I think that's a tough decision for a lot of people because, you know, if, 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 if you if you bootstrap it right and you quit your job, you lose all the money, all the potential you might have make. 
And then, you know, you're, you're just, of course, then you have more time to work in your business. But then if you keep the job, you know, you have your job responsibilities, but then less time to work your business. I definitely think it's like almost a chicken egg thing and a difficult decision for a lot of people to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, I feel like people, you know, have, I mean, we have people that work with us who do side projects in music and, and do side projects in photography and art. Um, and so for us, um, it's a way to have a creative outlet. Like we talked about at the very beginning of this show, it's a way to have a creative outlet in addition to the, the technical you know, expertise that we bring to the table. Um, so it's just, like I said, it's a way to balance your life and it's a way to balance, uh, your career. So, yeah. And it's still also like a lot of investors they won't even talk to you unless you're going full-time, right? they like, so you're yeah. working for, you know, Amazon and you're trying to raise funds. And then, you know, the investor says, Hey, can you pitch me at 2 PM on Wednesday? And Oh crap. I got a Amazon meeting at two thirty, right? You know, so it's kind of hard to balance mm -hmm. those things. I think so. I definitely think if you go on a fundraise, you got to go all in. I think, but this is my opinion. No, I mean I agree because um, I'm familiar with Bunker Labs. Um, there's one here in Nashville. Um, you know, I've uh, worked with the Entrepreneur Center downtown, mentoring uh, business owners. I've um, had some interactions with Jumpstart Foundry, which does healthcare IT. Um, and, you know, they build programs that you've spoke about earlier, Jason, uh, they build cohorts in uh, technology, healthcare, entertainment, um, to help with exactly that, which is, um, you know, facilitating funding, facilitating business growth, and um, kind of going from there. So and how long were you, it's called the National Entrepreneur Center, right? Yes, yes, it is. And are you, are you still doing stuff with them? Um, I've, I, I sign up to be a mentor every year. Um, it's just kind of hit or miss on what they're looking for. Um, you know, sometimes they'll seek me out for, um, opportunities, uh, around it with Keller Schrader. Uh, sometimes they'll seek me out for opportunities around, you know, sales process management. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always, you know, trying to go to networking mixers there. Uh, it's just a way to give back to the community, you know, at this point. So, and, and from your time working with them, what from your point of view have you seen entrepreneurs consistently get wrong and you just don't want to shake them like you're like you're the 10th you're the 100 person that's wrong please stop making this mistake i think one thing is um they're so kind of drawn out into like different directions as an entrepreneur that it is the follow-up on certain situations like um if you talk to me and you um want to facilitate a conversation in a certain direction, uh, like I was saying, like sales, marketing, operations, and then you want to, you know, have me introduce you to like three or four people, four or five people, and I do so, it's not getting part of that follow-up of, you know, I'm trying to help you facilitate introductions to get you more knowledge to make better business decisions as you grow. Um, so what can we do to, um, you know, to help understand as an entrepreneur that we need to follow up, we need to include people in conversations. Um, and that's what I think is the most frustrating thing that I've seen. So. So what's the, what's the tech startup scene like in Nashville? Is it pretty vibrant? Is like in the early stages, how's that going? Um, as far as the tech startup scene, um, there are, you know, we work with a couple of, um, of FinTech companies and a couple of healthcare tech companies in Nashville um, that started out as part of the entrepreneur organization uh, and worked their way up to, um, you know, some, some status. Um, we obviously have Oracle coming. Uh, we have, um, you know, Assurance here. Uh, we have uh, a very large Amazon presence. Um, so we have some big players. We also have some small players. Uh, so I would say that the tech scene is very healthcare tech related and, and financially technology related uh, as far as startups. So, And where people raise money, is there enough VC money or angel money there so they can raise locally or they have to go like the, um, the Bay Area or, or New York City? Yeah. Um, I mean, there are people who will go to like Atlanta, Boston, Chicago. Um, you know, there was just actually an article in the newspaper um, last week for the Nashville Business Journal. Uh, that one individual is starting a healthcare fund focused on minority owned healthcare IT companies. Um, and so there are people here who are looking to um, be able to bring a certain amount of funding to the um, 
to Nashville, but obviously any large funding would need to be done at a uh, at a larger metropolis. So, are there any stops in Nashville like Kodoka have made it, so to speak, that like are nationally known? Oh man, that's a good question, Jason. Um, off the top of my head, not that I not that I can think of. I mean. I mean, obviously, every company started at one time, um, you know, as something small. I mean, we've had some homegrown companies that are fairly well, that do fairly well, like Cracker Barrels in Lebanon, Tennessee. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Cracker Barrel. It's yeah. like a yeah. nationwide chain. Uh, they're out of Lebanon, Tennessee. Um, we have some some homegrown, obviously, like HCA Healthcare was was founded in uh, in Nashville um, by Jack Massey, as well as a couple other healthcare companies that he founded. And he's brought, you know, he brought, you know, Belmont to, to notoriety with the business school. And um, so, I mean, there are some larger companies that have definitely started out as small organizations in Nashville that have become successful, uh, mostly in the, in the hospital um, and banking realm. So, so James, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you know, whether you have a small business trying to build a billion dollar company, everyone tells you, you know, don't quit, you no, know, keep on going, keep on grinding, you know, if you quit, success might be around the corner, you know, all that kind of stuff. But is there a time when entrepreneurs should quit when they should say, okay, this isn't working. I need to do something else. Um, I feel like if you're at a point where you, you're always, you know, trying to innovate, like one thing that I always say is, uh, you know, you want to collect knowledge, uh, create new knowledge from that and then discard what you don't need. I think we get to the point where you've created knowledge and you feel like you are at the last iteration of, whatever product or service you're trying to offer and you're just missing the niche. Um, I feel like there's times that people want to quit, but there's always ways to um, do something better than what is already being done. Um, You know, I have, I have this conversation with my wife all the time. Like, you know, people, pretty much everything in the world, to my knowledge, has been created at this point. Um, What it is, is just doing something better than somebody else, whether it's through customer service, saving money, saving time. Um, And and so for me, uh, I don't feel like there's ever a time to quit. I feel like there's times to step back and maybe redirect your career into something else and kind of go from there. So... So James, I think a lot of people, you know, become entrepreneurs or founders or small business owners. Mm-hmm. They have no idea about the muscles, high and lows, right? One, one, if actually one minute you might be on top of the world, next minute you might be crushed, right? What's your yeah. advice on entrepreneurs, like dealing with all the emotional stuff you have to go through? Yeah, I think it's, it's kind of like being a, a salesperson and, and kind of like in our world is you have to deal with a lot of rejection um, and you got to persevere. Uh, so for us, um, you know, it's, uh, it's being like, you know, you're going to get rejection from either a funding or your idea is going to kind of fall flat um, and kind of go from there. But the perseverance of, um, you know, persevering in your idea and your beliefs that you're going to be successful, um, I think that is is the most important thing um, is to deal with the highs and lows is just understanding there is going to be rejection, but you got to persevere. So so I you know a lot of founders, it's kind of got a cost of sales a little bit. You know, a lot of founders, they know they have to like get on the phone or you know, do user testing, all that kind of stuff. But for whatever reason, they know I got to call people today, number one focus, and they'll go do number 20 because no, that's good. I call them people that they want either rejection or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. What's your advice for like having a phone? You know what? Get on the phone and call people. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had this conversation with a, with a mentor of mine, and I believe you know, people are at this point where they want to talk to somebody, whether it's because of the pandemic and all they've done is, you know, Zoomed or, you know, set on phone calls. People want to meet with people face-to-face, like for sales calls. They want to have a phone conversation. Um, Everybody sends emails, uh, sends, you know, postcards or, you know, email, the email blast or a a mailing blast to, um, generate business. And I feel like everybody right now is, um, you know, just hungry for interaction, like whether it's a phone call. And so I feel like you're getting a better success with picking up the phone and and dialing somebody versus, you know, getting on a Zoom call or a WebEx call or, you know, sending them an email. Um, So it's, it's just coaching somebody in the sales 
person performance realm and saying, you know, hey, you're, you're going to be successful. You just got to you know, be able to do it and pick up the phone. Um, and understanding that if you make 25 calls, you might get a hold of one or two people, but that could be all you need to be successful. So, yeah, I remember seeing this on LinkedIn a while ago. Someone did a post. It was like, you know, one of those you know, quote unquote sales experts. And they said co calling is dead. But if we just said, I'm guessing you don't believe that's true, correct? Um, no, I think it's a, you know, part of a, a, a bigger system of, um, you know, contacts as far as, you know, doing a LinkedIn touch point with somebody a couple of times, sending them a LinkedIn message, um, maybe then sending them an email two or three days later, and then picking up the phone and calling them, you know, a couple of days later. So that way they've had, you know, a few touch points with, um, you know, LinkedIn, with email, um, and you're at the point where you're ready to pick up the phone and make the phone call. They already have some some clarity about you. Like they already know what, what you do. You're just giving them an incentive to talk to you is by picking up the phone, so. So Jamie, you know, they'll tell you to like, do, do, do sales calls or whatever, you'll follow mm -hmm. up, right? Follow, follow up, follow yep. up. Yep. When is there a time you should stop following up? Like, you know, and what's the, is there like a preferred method? Like, you know, first email day one, another email mm -hmm. four days later, and then you follow up like every 20 days or is it time that you should just stop? I feel like it's um, people will put together um, a cadence of like emails, phone calls, LinkedIn, um, maybe Twitter, maybe some other like Facebook post, um, something in the social media realm. Um, but I feel feel like if you get a hold of somebody and they will give you um, the cadence they're looking for to talk to them, whether it's an email, a phone call once every two weeks, once every four weeks, hey, touch base with me once every, every two months. Um, I feel like you have to set that cadence. Um, I will normally reach out to somebody um, probably three to four times in a two month period. And if I don't get a hold of them, I'll probably hold off for two or three months and start over again. Uh, because sometimes it's just, it's just bad timing. You never know what's going on in their life. Uh, they could just maybe not be open to networking. They maybe might not be open to, um, um, you know, the sales that you're trying to sell. They may have a change of leadership. They may have uh, a new position. So it's, um, it's just understanding that there's always bad timing, there's good timing, and you just got to find the right time. So, James, is there an, an official definition of what spam is? Or is that pretty much up to every person to determine what that, what that is? Um, I think it depends. Um, you know, I was doing some work earlier this week um, for Keller Schrader and prospecting for our um, technology vendor summit at this end of this March. And um, I was, I was probing people based on just emails within our prospect list for ConnectWise. And, um, you know, people were getting bounce backs or this message is too large. And so sometimes it's spamming if people will tell you they don't want to get your messages and you, and you still send them stuff. Like that's my version of spam is I've told you I don't want to get it and you still continue to send it to me. So why are you doing that? Um, for me, it's, hey, I'm trying to figure out, does your email address work? Are you still at this position? Are you still at this company? Um, I need to scrub my data to get rid of information that's not relevant. So that's part of it for me is, you know, that initial outreach that I did earlier this week is not really spam, but, you know, a couple of people reached back out and said, hey, um, I don't want to get any information. If I continue to send them stuff, that would be spam. To me, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people need more understanding when they, you know, what they think is spam, right? I, I mm -hmm. think a lot of people like get a message and they immediately report it or they send you a nasty message, you know. But I definitely like your point of view better. But yeah, what, what, yeah. Can, you, what so, can you do, right? You just keep plugging away and see what happens. So, you know, and is there any like, like certain like sales tools y'all use, like any kind of sales platform y'all use? I know you mentioned HubSpot, do you use them or you use something else, or what's the best for y'all um, to use? So Keller Schrader uses ConnectWise. Uh, it is a combination of a technical platform um, and a account management platform. So there's like a manage section, a sell section. Um, you can keep track of like project management for technical stuff. Uh, you can keep track of your accounts. You can keep track of activities and opportunities. 
So it's, uh, it's a very robust uh, piece of software. Um, I personally use HubSpot as well because I like to keep like people who are connectors uh, separate from like our prospect pool. So we're not like constantly sending my connectors marketing information and, and um, making them feel obligated to connect me to people. Um, we do um, pretty much everything that I do through ConnectWise. So um, that would be my kind of go-to at this point. So, and, and how did you find the connect wise? Like uh, some vendor come approach you and, and showed you a system or what was your process for picking that vendor over, over different vendors? Hey, James, I think you froze up. So James just froze on us. Hello? Yeah, yeah, you froze for a minute. Okay. So the last question I asked you was um like how do you how did you how did you pick this vendor? Like was yeah. the process you did to go like pick select them through two or three different ones or how that happened? Yeah, so um it was ConnectWise was in place before I got to Keller Schrader. Okay. Um so for me it was a situation where we needed a, a very technical background um CRM. And so for us it was, you know, something that is totally like IT related. So it allows us to um you know, use all parts of it for all facets of our job, uh, whether it's, you know, tracking activities, tracking opportunities, um, whether it is, um, you know, a attaching proposals, stuff like that. So it's, it's just kind of a one-stop shop for us to track all of our work. So, okay. And, and then we have a time, we have a time and entry system as well. So we can, you know, bill our time for like our, our technical services and stuff. So, Jim, next, talk about your, your time with the American Marketing Association and what you do with them. Um, so they're the ones I was referencing earlier. I just, um, I just, you know, rejoined American Marketing Association on behalf of Keller Schrader as uh, the collegiate relations chair. So I'm working with the college students um, to help, you know, broaden their chapters, uh, especially the chapters that are in Nashville. There's three of them. Uh, there's two or three other colleges that are having have an informal chapter. Um, so for me, it is uh, it's very rewarding to work with the college kids, and help them prepare for careers, help them prepare for um, you know their first foray into the real world. Um, so for them, it's it's a lot of you know networking, um, teaching them how to to manage their careers and kind of get them started on the right foot. So James, suppose there's someone out there. And they're trying to decide to they 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 don't want to be, they either want to do sales or marketing they can't decide which one to go to what advice you have for them to pick the career. Um, so at Keller Schrader, we just went through um, a transition where we moved um, our sales and our marketing from two different silos under under to under one person. Um, so for me, that is I believe the way to go is when sales and marketing are working together uh, because it kind of. Uh, helps create that entire customer life cycle. So you have, you know, marketing through sale and customer success. And I, I would say that if I had to tell somebody sales is marketing and marketing is sales. So being involved in one or the other is going to, you know, hopefully get you to the same endpoint, which is finding a successful customer, being able to get referrals and, you know, cross sell as necessary. So. James, then I believe on March 30th, y'all are doing a, a 2022 tech vendor summit. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So we uh, at Keller Schrader have a um, technology vendor summit uh, in Evansville, Indiana. Um, so we, we currently work in Indiana, Illinois, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Alabama. Um, we are hosting the technology vendor summit in Evansville, which is where the headquarters is located. Uh, what it is, is it's a series of breakout sessions. Um, vendors are in touch with us about uh, showcasing their services and their products. 
Um, we have uh, a keynote speaker. Um, we just have, a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's a lot of opportunity for people to network, uh, learn about the value in other, other people's companies and uh, allows us to showcase what makes us so special. Um, so we're doing that. Uh, the goal would be to eventually move to um, the second location we have in Nashville and have a, a vendor summit down here at some point in time. So, and this, this is something y'all do every year? Yes. Yeah, so we, we actually um, didn't do it, I don't believe, last year because of COVID. So this is back for the first time since 2020, I guess, um, because it would have happened right at the start of COVID. Um, so it's been a couple of years. Uh, it's just a great way for us to, to get out there and, and be part of the community and, and bring, you know, some vendors together, some people together and showcase their talents. So, so James, you always talk about the sum, but can you go in more detail and answer the best you can, like how Calistrata got started, what y'all focus on right now and what's, what's the vision for the company going forward? Uh, so Keller Schrader has been in business for 43 years. Um, the, like I said earlier, um, regarding the HR positions and how we fill positions, um, the average tenure is 17 years, uh, for our employee owners. Uh, what makes us different is, uh, being an ESOP, an employee owned company. Um, it allows us each to have uh, a piece of ownership in the company. So we have a lot more shared responsibility, shared accountability of the decisions we make, everything from expense reports to margins to uh, total projects. Uh, we started as a small firm um, with two individuals. Uh, there are now uh, roughly 105 of us. Um, and so the average revenue is roughly around 55 million, uh, that we do in business a year. So, um, we focus on four different pillars of business. Uh, one is application development. Uh, one is infrastructure, which includes, uh, security. Uh, we do data strategy and then we also do, um, staffing and recruiting as well. So, so those are the four pillars that we work in and we just, uh, we aim to be a trusted advisor, um, give people performance management uh, and profitability through technology solutions. So, and I'm guessing you have, you have clients all across the United States. We do. So um, in Nashville, um, because of my proximity to um, transportation, that's a little bit more, um, conducive to business travel than Evansville. Um, we do have clients everywhere from Burbank, uh, California to Buffalo, New York. Um, so we do run across the nation, um, but the majority of our business is, is centered in the Midwest and the Southeast. So, so James, you know, sometimes seeing like every one of the mothers a recruiter, it's like yeah. every year, there's like, like 10 new tech startups who are going to, you know, fix the hiring problem across the United States, but it's like nothing ever changes, right? Why do you think mm -hmm. that is? Why nothing changes as far as tech recruiters or no, yeah, just a, uh, you know the same like, like I said, when I tried in 2015, you know, mm -hmm. you 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 you'd upload your resume next next screen, type in everything on your resume on the screen, right? You know, just stuff like that, you know, it's like nothing changes. It, it, all the all the disconnect, you know. Yeah. Um, I think it comes back to the follow-up. Like um, you know, people are still expecting some sort of human interaction when it comes to uh applying for a job and interviewing and the way that um you know the system works now where you it, it's it's bonkers to me that you literally have to put your resume in and then retype the information again that's just um, craziness i would never understand that <laughs> it's it's bonkers to me and so and then you get kicked out of the system because you don't um you don't match the wording that they have in the job description. Um, so I think that's one thing is just the frustration with the application process. I feel like two is um, sometimes the job description does not mimic what the actual job entails. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, I think another thing is, um, you know, people still want to have referrals and want to have um, introductions to, um, to people they want to hire like you still want to have that human interaction and when you make it all technology technology or you make it all um, digital to start it just makes it hard you know for people to to feel like they're wanted and then 
you know, when you have an introduction to a recruiter, or you have a referral to a recruiter and they don't follow up, um, you know, that definitely, you know, makes people feel unwanted. Uh, it makes people feel insecure. So is there some, some type of certification that recruiters have to get, you know, like if you're a county, you get a CPA, mm -hmm. if you're HR, you get a HPHR or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Is this something where recruiters have to go or anyone can become a recruiter? Um, I don't know specifically the answer to that question. Um, I know in our world, in the IT world, like a lot of our technical engineers have several different certifications. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure that HR people need uh, recruiting certifications. I think uh, anybody could just become a recruiter. So. Yes, that's what I think so too, which, you know, of course, would be a good thing or a bad thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, because then you can maybe weed out some people. Um, but, you know, I, I say that, but there are some good recruiters out there that yeah. I know. I mean, they stay yeah. in touch. They, uh, they are always willing to help. I mean, so there's – you get the good ones, you get the bad ones. So there, There's definitely some good ones out there, definitely. Yeah. So can you talk more, like, about the IT piece of your company? Yeah. Um, so one of the um, – you know, pillars is the application development stuff uh, that we do, which spans the gamut of almost anything in the business process world. Um, we do I, IBM I um, applications. Uh, we do some applications for um, that you would see like in the iTunes store. So we do, um, you know, run the gamut with that. As far as our infrastructure, uh, like I said, it covers security. So anything that is a managed services uh, security operation to providing a managed security awareness, uh, managed detection response, um, firewalls, any kind of products that we do as far as, uh, you know, switches and routers that kind of handles that, any endpoints, so your, your laptops, your peripherals. And then our newest one is, is our data strategy. And so, um, you know, that's taking math and science uh, to your business problems uh, to better your business. And so um, I just did a podcast a couple weeks ago regarding digital transformation uh, in, the, uh, in the, the world of data strategy and, um, you know, talking about how, you know, in the utility world with like gas and electric that we will... Um, you know, reduce a business process from seven steps to five steps, make it mobile and allow us to uh, render emergencies um, in a quicker manner. So it's cybersecurity and IT, those two separate things, correct? Well, they're about the so, same. So our infrastructure group at Keller Schrader oversees products and services. So like um, network implementation, but also security implementation. assessment a penetration assessment a security assessment and so we will do that and then um we will you know recommend certain products um within the um within the mindset of you know you need something that's turnkey would you like something that we can help manage and it kind of goes from there so so what you've seen so far like how unprotected are most small businesses versus cybersecurity threats oh um the people are definitely uh, unprotected. Uh, we have, you know, clients that, you know, we've talked about them with their vulnerabilities for months and they don't do anything about it. Um, and then they wonder why people are, you know, clicking on phishing emails, um, clicking on scams, um, you know, and it's, it's not, you know, the hundred, 200, $300 that a personal, you know, individual might send to a, a scammer, we're talking like multi thousands of dollars um, that somebody may inadvertently send to a scammer. Um, you know, the other big thing is risk management insurance has gone up um, drastically in the last year. Uh, people have seen their premiums skyrocket by a thousand percent. And so part of that is you have to have a, you know, security incident replay in, in place, uh, security response incident replaced in, in place. And you have to have, um, you know, some sort of vulnerability assessment. So, you know, like where you're penetratable, um, where things are, um, you know, just kind of sitting out there for the taking. So James, what's it called? Like when someone hacks your, your company and then you have to pay them like a million dollars or something like that. Does that name for it? I can't Rans think what it is. 
ransom ransomware. Okay, yeah, that's it, right? Yeah, that's like that's been like very, very like an I don't, I, probably is the wrong term to use, like very prevalent recently. Yeah, so we talked about, um, you know, we were talking about the day of the Super Bowl. I believe it was the San Francisco 49ers got a ransom for like twenty nine million dollars. Um, and you know, obviously the deal is you don't have to pay 29 million, like they'll settle for less than that. Um, but it's a situation where you have to, it's something you got to deal with, you know, um, and you know, people are ransoming small businesses to large businesses. So it's, uh, it is what it is, you know, I mean, you gotta, you gotta deal with it. So, so Jim, you know, you heard the news all the time, like, you know, company gets hacked or whatever the case may be. I have to wonder. Or two part question: How many companies get hacked they don't even know about it, and then how many mm-hmm. companies are hacked that they don't make it public because they don't want to know because they're worried about the branding of being hacked? Yeah, um, I think I think one if if you're probably a private company, based on what I know about regulations, if you're a private company, you probably don't have to disclose that. But if you're a public company, it probably has to be disclosed um, that you're either paying a ransom or you've been ransomed. Um, I do know of a couple of situations where uh, hackers have got into a system and been dormant in the system uh, for months uh, just to gather information about the client and then mimic the client at some point in time. Um, so that's that's one part of the question is I, I think it depends on the size of the company and the type of company, whether or not you have to report it. Um, but two, um, you know, people will get hacked and not know that they're hacked because the person is just sitting there waiting to gather as much information as possible to put together a, a scam and try to uh, try to fish fish money from people. So, James, what can individual people do to protect themselves from this kind of stuff? You might not have the resources um, for, for big corporations. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, as far as for individual, um, you know, we do, uh, we work with know before, which is a managed security awareness. Uh, they do a scam of the week. Um, we take that scam of the week and we send it out to our clients so they know um, what to what not to do. A lot of it is, you know, just watching out for the fact that in the current events, uh, like with the Ukrainian, you know, Russian war, like, you know, there are people who are trying to scam money for the Ukrainians um, to try to, um, you know, help them financially. Um, You have a situation where people will also look at, um, you know, sending links to the mail, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, you've won a, you've won a settlement. Um, So one, it's just being uh, socially aware of social social engineering. Uh, two is you know using spam filters if necessary. If you have the ability on your computer or your phone to have a a free um, you know endpoint protection, uh, we use Carbon Black. We use Mimecast. Um, there's Windows Defender as well that you can use. So it's um it's you know there's there's all different kinds of options for people out there and it's just, uh, but a lot of it comes down to just being smart about the situation, so. Yeah, I remember one time my aunt, she's like in her 70s, she got an email, the email said, I'm, I'm Lieutenant Colonel John Brown, I'm a prisoner of the Syrian military, you know, in order to get out, you ha- I need for you to send me money, please. Yeah, it's, um, and the other thing too, is they prey on people who, um, you know, may have, uh, you know, because of age, cognitive disabilities, um, and, and, and get a hold of people. And it's, it's unfortunate. It's just like sales. I mean, it's, you, you have a, you have a shotgun approach to sales, uh, to narrow it down what you're really looking for with people. And, um, you know, you shoot out, you know, 250 emails and if you get people to respond, that's what you're looking for, you know? So, so, so back to sales real fast, you brought it up. So, so, you know, they, they'll tell you, no, no, do your, do your phone calls with a case and hear your pitch. What's, when for you, like, go well, refine your pitch? Like, suppose you did 30 calls, all the 30 people said no, or 40 people said no. When you see you, like, stop, okay, this isn't working. Five calls, 10 calls, is it like a standard number for that? Um, as far as, like, what you're saying yeah, in the what, pitch? What, or, yeah, what you're saying, yeah. yeah. The whole, everything, what you're saying, how you're saying it, the whole approach. Mm-hmm. I think it comes down to um, you have to be able to offer them something of value in the conversation. Uh, a lot of times people will say stuff like, 
do you have 27 seconds to t- for me to tell you why I called? Because it's just a random number. And to me, I don't feel like that works. Um, or they'll just call and be like, I know I probably caught you at a bad time. Well, they're not expecting your call. It's probably not a good time anytime, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, yeah. So, um, you know, sending the email to, to kind of, or the LinkedIn touch point to really kind of lay the foundation about why you're calling. Um, they're probably not going to read the email, but they're probably going to at least know who you are when you call. Um, the other thing um, that we work with is, you know, we have an appointment setter. And so that person will, you know, restructure their, their call um, queue, will restructure their call flow, uh, will restructure their call script um, to try to, you know, engage people in different ways. Um, and then, you know, people will say to us, well, there's something that this person said that really resonated with me. And this is why I wanted to talk to you. Or, you know, we are really struggling with our current provider. We want to have other options. So it just kind of depends on, like I said earlier in this call, in this, uh, you know, uh, program that it just kind of depends on the timing uh, of what you're, what you're shooting for. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing too, if you're doing a sales call, you need, you need to be as high energy as you can, right? Versus like monotone or you got to be. Even if you're not high yeah. energy, you need to kind of fake it and be high energy. High energy. I think high energy, or um, you know, for Keller Trader, it's like I've said multiple times, it's about being trusted as an advisor and not so much a salesperson. Uh, so some of our best people are are very laid back when it comes to um, how they approach a client. Uh, it's very, you know, very southern draw. Uh, you know, a midwestern accent, just kind of a you know, hey, how you doing? Um, it just kind of depends. So, but we, I don't know that many of us are very high energy when it comes to how we prospect and how we network. It's more of, you know, this is what we do. This is what we're good at. Uh, we'd love to help you. So, so James, do you, do you find that, you know, you get to approach like sales differently based on this area? Like, you know, maybe you have to approach it one way in the South, different way in the West, just based on different cultural differences and way things are done in different places. Yeah, I think uh, the one thing I've talked about with um, our VP of sales and marketing and and other people in our company is, um, you know, Nashville is uh, such a larger metropolis than where our headquarters is, even though in Evansville, we do work with a lot of big companies that are headquartered there uh, and have ancillary sites there. Um, In Nashville, the sense of urgency is a little greater um, than where we are headquartered out of. So for us, um, you know, we definitely want people to know that we can adapt and we can bring that sense of urgency to Nashville that they need, which we do, but we can also be very uh, laid back and methodical um, like we are in Evansville with our, with our clients. Um, So it's, it's really understanding the culture and the environment uh, of the client versus the culture and environment of our company and making sure that they blend and mesh well together. So, James, so it seems like most business people are using LinkedIn as a platform, right? Whether sales, B2B, B2C, or the case mm-hmm. may be. Are there any other, uh, any other social media platforms out there you recommend people to use? So, we use. Um, we use YouTube for our podcasts. Um, we use um, Twitter. We use Facebook. We use LinkedIn. And I want to say we use Instagram, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I feel like people can get really wrapped up in, you know, I use Twitch or I use TikTok or Snapchat or um, at the end of the day, there are some that I feel that are just meant for business, like a Twitter um, you know, a Google review page, um, a uh, LinkedIn page, uh, you know, if you are looking for just getting basic information, if you're very visual, I feel like there's Instagram, there's YouTube. Um, You know, we um, do a lot with, like I said, those five um, social media channels. Um, What I like about LinkedIn is I love to test things on LinkedIn, um, like the posts that I put out there, whether they are uh, posts that include a, a research project, a post that includes a video, a post that includes a, um, um, you know, a picture, whether it's mentioning people, whether it's not mentioning people. Um, so, yeah. So, hey, so so we have a special guest on a podcast now. I know we have we have <laughs> Liam. We have a little dog in the background. Back so. there, back there photoshopping. That's yeah. Great. So. 
So James, is there anything else that I should have asked you that I haven't or anything else you want to talk about? Um, no, I mean, like I said, you know, the, you know, when I, when I reached out to you, um, I really enjoy your podcast. I think that you, uh, cover a breadth of information for a lot of different people, uh, that makes it relevant what you talk about. Um, you know, I'm familiar with bunker labs. Um, you know, we have a lot of respect in our company for the military. So thank you for your service. Um, hey, and I like to, Hey James, whenever someone says, I always say, and thank you for, for paying your taxes or paying my retirement. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're welcome. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, you know, I personally am in, you know, involved in volunteering with a couple of uh, military based uh, associations here in Nashville. And, um, you know, the one thing I would say is, um, I know that, you know, you kind of broadcast on LinkedIn that you work in the HR realm, like, we're always looking for, you um, we're always looking for employee owners uh, in our region. Uh, we're always looking for uh, clients who need staffing and HR related services. Um, so we're, we're here to help. You know, we have, we have the, uh, the background, we have the uh, knowledge and we have uh, the tenure uh, in business. So. Hey James, I forgot to ask you this during the pre-talk and some people do this, some people don't, but do you have like any kind of gift or discount or resource for the listeners? Yeah. Um, so one of the, the couple of the things that we offer, uh, and I cleared this with marketing before I, before I got on the, the, the podcast was, um, we will, if people are willing to, to give us 15 minutes, uh, of a phone conversation, we will donate, um, to a United way approved association of their choice, uh, for $25. Um, there's an opportunity for a greater donation. Um, and then we also um, are currently offering uh, between one and three hours of a free assessment out, uh, depending on uh, which uh, pillar of opportunity you're looking for, whether it's applications, uh, infrastructure, security. Uh, so we are offering, you know, our time and services um, just to kind of give people a uh, a, a frame of mind, whether it's uh, about an incident response plan, uh, whether it's about an application that they need help with, um, we're willing to offer, you know, that time. So, and James, all, all the job you're looking to fill, all, the, all those posts on your website? Yes, they're all currently on the website, um, you know, for both uh, our company as an employee owners, but also for our, um, but also for our clients that we service. Uh, but like I said, you know, always looking for employee owners uh, that fit our culture and our environment of shared accountability and always looking for um, always looking for clients that, that need help uh, facilitating uh, facilitating employment. So, James, can you share your social media for both yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Um, yeah, it's uh, www.kellerschrader.com. Uh, That's uh, K-E-L-L-E-R. S C H R O E D E R dot com. Um, and then you can click on the five links at the top that have the five different social media platforms we talked about. Um, and you can you can get me through there. So and to listen who have the links to, to his, his resource and gift and the, and his social media on the show notes. You find the show notes yeah. at ww.cabinetshoblog.com. Be sure to share this episode with your friends and your network and be sure to rate review and subscribe to the Jason Cabinet Experience. So James, we're coming in and we're talking. Can you give us any last minute advice and wisdom on, on anything you want to talk about? Um, you know, they they asked me on the last podcast I did for the digital transformation and data strategy. And um, you know, the I, I had a, a nice biblical quote that I can't, you know, recite from from scratch at this point in time, but it basically alluded to uh never be complacent when it comes to your personal or professional work. Um you know, there is what you do every day at work. And then there's everything you do outside of work and just don't be complacent. Always be pushing yourself, always drive yourself. Um, but be patient because being impatient, uh, can also hinder your drive. So James, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. Have a great day. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day. Thanks.